In today's show, the Blazers keep it rolling on the road with a big win in Toronto. Damian Lord speaks to the media about his surgery and what's next. And Lamar Hurd joins the program to talk about Trendon Watford and CJ Ellaby. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts. And now also on YouTube, if you're listening to my voice and haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, remedy that now. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. I truly appreciate it. In today's show, we're talking the Blazers' big win over the Toronto Raptors, wrapping up a road trip at 4-2, and two, a six-game trip at 4-2. and two. Who could have seen it coming? They more they doubled their road wins in a single trip. Pretty, pretty impressive. We'll talk about that win. We'll talk about uh, Damon Lord's comments. He spoke to the local media for the first time uh, since uh, since having surgery on his abdominal muscles. And he discussed sort of what the future and near-term and long-term future will be for him. And then finally, to close today's show, Lamar Hurd joins the program. Blazers broadcaster, we're going to talk a little bit about Trenton Watford and C.J. Ellaby. It's a fun one, but let's do what we do first. The fastest recap in the West. Blazers win 114-105 in Toronto, and this was a blowout early. Blazers led 33-15 after one and 62-34 at the break. This was a beatdown. The Blazers had an effective field goal percentage over 75%, and we're holding the Toronto Raptors. To, a, to an offensive rating of under 70. Um, just an absolute beatdown. Home to 34 points in the first half. I, just, this was, an, this was an ass whooping, but the NBA, everybody makes the run. Raptors got a little bit of it back in the third quarter, trailed it by just 17, heading into, just 17, but 17 heading into the fourth. And then, then they they made their move, right? Like this, they, they ratcheted up the defense. They started uh, full court trapping. They started, they just, they played harder and more aggressive than they had in the first two quarters and damn near stole it. On a Fred Van Vliet three-pointer with a minute and 24 seconds left, the Raptors had cut their deficit all the way down to four. This was, this was all of a sudden a ball game until the one man, Anthony Simons, showed up. Ant hit back-to-back threes, first to make it seven, then after a Blazer stop to make it 10 with under a minute remaining. And the Blazers held on because of two big buckets from Anthony Simons and what would have been kind of a kind of an embarrassing loss turned into a still comfortable on 114-105. Blazers get a win, wrap up a six-game road trip, four and two. Anthony Simons didn't shoot particularly well. He was you know, before he made those two shots. He was four of fourteen from the fleet of field, but he hit two absolutely crucial ones. Finished with nineteen points and five assists. CJ McCollum continues to look like a pretty good, darn, pretty darn good basketball player in his return. Nineteen points, ten boards, six assists for CJ on eight of twelve shooting. Didn't get to the free throw line. Would be my only nitpick there, but CJ was really good. Eleven and eleven from Yusuf Nurkic. Nineteen from Nazir Little to go with seven boards, three assists, a steal, and a block. Nas. A ball player and looks like one. Ben McLemore, Benny Mac doing what he does, hit five threes off the bench, finished with 17 points. Uh, CJ LB finished with nine and three boards. Trenton Watford, six points, six boards, three assists, and a block in 15 minutes. We'll talk about those two youngsters, two, two of the Blazers' young guns at the end of this episode. For the, on, the, uh, on the Raptors' side, 28 points from uh, Pascal Siakam, eight boards, five dimes. He was awful in the first half. He went nuts in the second half. He was really, really good. He had two in the first half, and then he he came on strong. He finished with 28. Fred Van Vliet, 19 on 6 of 19 shooting. Struggled a little bit from the floor. Uh, Chris Boucher, 11 points off the bench. Uh, Gary Trent Jr., former Blazer, great. Finished with 13. OG Ananobi, 11, 8, 5, 3 steals and 2 blocks. But the Blazers win this game, and it was a dominant game. Um, d- dominant first half, rather, and then they held on when it mattered. Um the good thing about building a 30 point lead is that you're up 30 and you can kind of give some of it back. Uh, the Raptors made a, a, a strong late push that physical defense. It, it, to some extent, it, it took the Blazers out of what they wanted to do, but this wasn't just a huge win. 
as the Blazers keep rolling along. For those of you who are trying to conduct the tank, the Blazers just simply won't let you. In fact, right here in this exact space, this same chair, I said, heading out into this, uh, the Blazers had beaten the Kings. I was recording a podcast. Beat the Kings. Kings aren't very good. Blazers didn't play very good. Get the win. They had a second night of back-to-back against Brooklyn and the six-game road trip. And I sat right here and I said, you know, generously, the Blazers are going to go three and four over their next seven games. That's, that's a generous read. That was before we knew CJ McCollum was going to come back for sure, for sure. We knew he was going to come back eventually, but we didn't exactly know when. Um, I'm not even offering a caveat here. I was dead ass wrong. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter like what we didn't know at the time. They've won six of the last eight and five and two since, the, since I said they were going to go three and four. They went generously three and four, five and two. They look like a they look like a playoff level basketball team. Now, it's not ideal for the current situation. Um, missing the playoffs is probably more valuable to them in the long term. We'll talk about that a little bit in the second segment. But um, it's nice to see a team with talent play like a team that's talented. An impressive win Friday against the Boston Celtics. Um, they follow that up with an even more impressive win Toronto to wrap up a road trip with two wins. I thought those were probably losses, although Boston game was one of those probably three, actually, when I was penciling it out. Orlando, Washington, Boston. Those are the games I thought they would win. They tacked on that win and they tacked on that win in Brooklyn or against Brooklyn and Portland. They tacked on this win um, it, against the Raptors, which I thought was almost, an almost certain loss, maybe showing my sort of Raptor bias there. Whoops. Um, They go five and two in their last seven since I kind of condemned them to be a below 500 team. In fact, they look better. They came into this road trip with two road wins. They had two road wins. They were two and 12 on the road. They leave six and 15. They doubled or, you know, they uh, more than doubled, whatever. They they 200% more road wins on this trip than they had coming in. They're balling. Amity Simons continues to show that he can play. CJ McCollum, good basketball player, sort of maligned, much maligned, but like it, it's nice to have someone as good as CJ back. Um, he's really helpful. Uh, Nazir Little continues to be, um, continues to show that he's like a starting player in the NBA. And when you get five threes from Ben McMore off the bench, you're going to win. And he was really important in that sort of first half surge when they just made sure that this, you know, up 30 in the first half, up, up 28 at halftime, you need to win those games. The Blazers did it. This was an impressive win and kudos to them for just looking better. They have, um, you know, this season kind of went the wrong way. And uh, I think maybe fans and strategically it'd be better probably if they just straight up didn't get there. Uh, but this team, these players, players don't tank and this team has enough talent to kind of write the ship. And what you're watching them right now is write the ship. I'm not like raising the banner for a team that's 20 and 26, but they have just undeniably looked better this week. I sat here on, and I record Monday show on Sunday afternoons. I'm back here on a Sunday afternoon. I thought we were going to talk about a bad team looking bad again. They look good. This is the best they've looked all year, just straight up. Um, it's come without Damian Lillard, um, and it's and it's come against you know there was some wins against some inferior competition at home. Then they will go on the road, and you know they took care of the wins they were supposed to took care of, and, and then and then they beat teams that I think are about on equal footing, and maybe in Toronto a team that's a little better than them. You win those games on the road; those are impressive wins. There's no other way to call it. There's no other way to call it. They look good. Um, <laughs> Sorry to the tank commanders. They look good. There's no other way to say it. Um, that's 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 your normalist recap in the West. I, sh- I should have said that after the first minute, but that's your fastest recap in the West here nine minutes into the show. But uh, what I want to do, you know, like hats off to the Blazers. They come back for two in the middle of the week and then they, you know, against Minnesota and Dallas, intriguing games. We'll talk about them shows later in the week. And then they head back on the road for four more. Um, this was supposed to be the January that things fell apart and they haven't let them fell apart. So kudos to the dudes who are playing. Kudos to, to Amphrey Simons, who's who's really come into his own and been a reliable player and to Nas and to CJ coming back rolling and to Nurk, who's had five consecutive double doubles. Props to these dudes. Props to the Blazers for figuring it out. And props to Trent Watford and CJ LB, guys getting minutes who are kind of figuring out. And respect to Dennis Smith Jr. who closed this game and finished with just what Dennis Smith Jr. does. Five and six plus 14. Like, he's not going to wow you, but he gets it done. And this is a team that is getting it done. Um, And the stretch of their schedule, the stretch of the year that they were supposed to let go of the rope, this team won't do it. This team is finding its footing. Chauncey Gulps has them playing better and smarter. So, um, you know, props to them and apologies to those of you rooting 
aggressively for losses from the couch because this team just won't lose. They, they don't want to do it. Um, let's come back in the second segment on, uh, on Saturday. Damien Lord spoke to reporters about his surgery for the first time, speaking uh, to an assembled group of media and talked about his present, his future, what's next for Blazers. That's what we'll do in the second segment. Talk all about Dame. But first, let me tell you about Truebill. It is the app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. Truebill is here to make it incredibly simple. You just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And if it's more than one tap, you've got a Truebill concierge that's there to cancel your unwanted subscriptions for you so you don't have to. I've used Truebill, and from the time that I went to truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA to the time I had the app downloaded and was looking at them on my phone, less than 15 minutes, probably took 10 total minutes. Super easy to use, super quick to get my eyeballs on everything I was paying for, decide what I wanted to keep and what I didn't want to keep, and move from there. So why don't you go ahead and start canceling today at truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now, truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. That's truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Today's show is also brought to you by Bill Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. That's what they're doing. They're not playing around. They're making delicious bars. Plus, they pack a punch, 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories, four to five grams of sugar, and no more than five grams of net carbs in all of their bars. So whether you're reaching for cookies and cream or peanut butter brownie or coconut uh, brownie chunk, or whether you're reaching for raspberry or salted caramel or double chocolate, whatever it might be, all of them are going to pack a punch. Tasty, healthy Go get yourself some. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your next order. That's LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. Let's keep it rolling here. We talked about the Blazers' impressive 114-105 win over the Raptors. Portland's playing its best basketball of the season at the time when they were supposed to be playing their worst basketball of the season. Surprise! But this is kind of what they do, and I'll say they've they've found the rhythm and they've got some contributions from some guys. But part of what's next for the Blazers is taking a step from what they are, a competitive team, to, to, to being a really good one, right? Like that's the step they need to take, the good to great step. Um, This year they took a a step from good to bad. Uh, I think they have the talent to get back to good pretty quickly, but the next step is good to great. And so much of good to great is the health of Damon Lord. This year he wasn't himself. Um, you know, you look at his numbers and he's just, his shooting was way down. His production was st- still up and his, his sort of his advanced numbers suggest he was so good, but he was just, you watch him. He's just clearly not himself. And he chose to have, uh, you know, after consulting with multiple doctors, chose to have uh, abdominal surgery to clear up a, a lingering chronic ab issue that's been bothering him for a long time. And then on Saturday, he spoke to reporters, assembled media for the first time. He'd previously done a, a like a big, long, thoughtful interview with Casey Holdall, trailblazers.com. But that like, that's in-house media. It was a one-on-one. There was, we didn't like see Dame. This was the first time he sat in front of cameras, did all that stuff. Like we kind of got, you could you just, you know, props to Casey for getting an interview, but it's just a different thing. Like when you kind of see the demeanor and all those things um, and like, formalize it or whatever so you get to kind of like this is kind of not that it's like less on the record but it's just a little bit different feel when you sit in front of the media and answer questions as opposed to um doing a long thoughtful interview with someone who works for the team um it is what it is but so i this is like the not dame's first public comments i don't mean to frame it as that but this is the first time um that he's he's spoken sort of this formal setting and and what we learned from this formal setting is that damon lord thinks he's been dealing with this ab thing on and off since the 2015 training camp he says that was the first time that he kind of showed up that was like that's the summer that lamarcus left lamarcus leaves in 2015 um this is the year that they win 44 games and make the second round of the playoffs that's so long ago ancient ancient times that's before the summer of 2016 pre evan turner and alan crab and mo harkless and, and you making all that money and, and myers making all that money this is like this was supposed to be the tank year and dame's been dealing with that ab stuff um for a long time. And he, he, he said, basically, um, it would always come and go is, 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 is the quote he gave is that he would be like, you know, it would show up and then he'd, and then he'd it'd be like, Oh, this is, you know, he used tight. It was like tightening up a lot in his abs and like, he's, Oh, I'm feeling this, feel this issue. And then basically this every year it would come back a little bit earlier and would linger, linger a little bit longer. So like we've seen Dame play straight up the best basketball of his career with, 
this issue with this chronic issue, the, a thing that flares up and stays with him. And he has, you know, there's been some time over the years where he's had to take a game or two off, but he played, you know, two full seasons with, um, with this thing without, you know, without missing a game, a lot of miles, a lot of games. Um, he just continued to play through it, which is why you can kind of get to his mindset of why he thought he could again play through it this year. Um, but it, it really flared up on him, you know, so he's been dealing with, with this a bunch. There isn't like an acute moment. There's like, Hey, this first time at training camp, I felt it. I felt it for a couple of days. We talked to the uh, training staff. This was the fall of 2015. And he's kind of been dealing with it now. And basically the summer of 2021 is when it became unbearable. He mentioned that um, at, at the Olympics, he was, it was just brutal for him. He, you know, he's, he's, season ends, he gets back to kind of get himself in basketball shape and go to Tokyo and try to, uh, you know, win a gold medal, which he did, but he was not himself. Like if you watched any of those Olympic games, he looked awful, awful. He just looked like he was playing through mud. Couldn't, couldn't get shots off. Um, you know, they were taking him off the floor at some important moments. Cause he just like, he wasn't a high level guard because he just wasn't physically right. Then it came out that he was, you know, had been dealing with this, but, uh, that report just kind of floated as, Oh, here's an injury. There was no real in-depth reporting about it. And because it had been a chronic injury, I think my tendency was to be like, yeah, he's been dealing with this. Um, I, there wasn't any real reporting on the severity of it until Josh Lloyd of, uh, locked on fantasy basketball of this network said like that it, it got to the point where Dame had considered surgery this summer, but then Dame came into training camp. He said he felt as good as he had. Um, and then I think playing again made him realize that it wasn't that good. In fact, he so he 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 explained the timeline a little bit, and I think this is worth digging into. He goes to he goes to uh, the Olympics. It's terrible. Um, it's really messed him up. He talks with Drew Holiday, his Olympic teammate, guard for the Bucks, and he talks he talks to Drew, and Drew says, "Oh yeah, I had the same surgery. Like, I had the same thing. You got to get surgery, man. Like you got to do it. Um, your body is just like you got to. This will get you right. I did it. Got me right. Like you're gonna miss some time, but but like." If you are experiencing the same symptoms I was, this is a necessity for you. And Dame was like, yeah, I probably do. But Dame Lord's 30 years old, 31 years old. He celebrated his 31st birthday in July, uh, right around this time. He had a honeymoon planned. He had a huge, huge family wedding plan with his long-term partner and mother of his three kids. Like this was, he had a huge family summer. And quite frankly, he admitted that like, he's a person who lives a life. He didn't want to... Um, he didn't want to have surgery. He didn't want to delay it. He wanted to live his life and, and, and have his off season. And, and he, he truly believed that he dealt with this a long time at the time. He truly believed he dealt with this a long time that a bunch of time off could get him right. And he, he took a month off, you know, wedding honeymoon, a month off of basketball came back and he said he felt really good. And I believe him that he felt really good. And then it didn't, it just wasn't there. And you, you saw sort of what it wasn't there. He mentioned that Kyle Lowry has had a similar surgery. One of the Morris twins has a similar surgery. Randall Cobb who played in the, uh, played in the NFL playoffs like this week, um, this weekend rather he, you know, he had a similar surgery and five or six weeks later he came back. So Dame is, Dame is a believer that he can come back. In fact, he said in about three weeks, he could return to the court doing some ball handling and shooting stuff. Three weeks is not playing basketball. Three weeks is like dribbling a basketball and that he's still, he's not in any rush to come back, but in six to eight weeks when he's reevaluated and he used that term, I know there was some reporting from Yahoo sports that said five to six weeks. And I'm sure that's in the cards, right? If Randall Cobb played a football game five or six weeks later, you could do it. Yikes. Um, <laughs> professional athletes are wild, but um, it's more like the six to eight week timeline. And, and, and Dame said he's in no rush and that so much of his decision to come back and play will be the direction of the team. Now the direction of the team will hinge a lot on what they do at the trade deadline, what direction they kind of decide to go there. But Dame admitted, like if they're playing for a draft pick, if they are, if they trade away some vets and they're going young and they're not, and they're not, you know, they're not going for it and trying to make the playoffs that he won't play that he'll just, he'll, he'll, he'll see, he'll see the writing on the wall. He'll have those discussions with the front office, but he won't, um, you know, he's not going to come back and play for a team. That's not trying to win. That isn't prioritizing winning in the near term. Cause he says he's not wired that way. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what he's wired. Like he's too good. If he plays, they're going to win too many games. I got, they'll have to keep him off the court. Like it'll make more sense for the team to do so. Um, he mentioned that his goal is to win the championship. He's taking a long-term view. Um, he doesn't necessarily, which to, to me reads like, even if they're close to making the playoffs, he's not going to come back for the last 10 games and make that push. Now, if things change between now and then, if they, if they continue this sort of trajectory, um, I don't know if that, that, how realistic that is, but let's say they do, that will impact Dame's thinking, but he, he, he said it, he's in no rush. Like, I think he's taken a realistic approach. He also mentioned that 
he hasn't he hasn't gotten to the point where he's had the discussions with Joe Cronin about what the team's goals are, like whether they want to whether they're going to play to maintain their lottery protected draft pick. And that would mean, you know, not making the playoffs or they're going to go for it and try to like, you know, get the magic right, hope things break their way, become a playoff team and, you know, make the run. Um, Like just from my perspective, it makes way more sense to miss the playoffs this year and try again next season and have Dame fully healthy. It's just strategically the value of having your draft pick this year is, is the most is, is mu- has much more sort of long-term value and near-term value for the team than um, being the seventh best team in the Western Conference. Uh, players don't tank though. So if the Blazers keep winning, we will have that conversation in the future. They have enough talent that they're going to win some games between here and there. But I think that's, that's what we learn from Dame. He's in no rush. He's open to maybe sitting out the remainder of the season, but he understands that there is a timeline in which he could be available to play between six and 10 weeks from now. And if he's available in that window, that means there'll be some time left in the regular season. The Blazers will have to make a decision on what they want to do. That's what we learned from Dame's uh, media availability. If you want to watch it, it's on the Blazers YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it's also on KGW.com and a couple other places, but uh, the Blazers have it on there. Um, you can check it. You search YouTube for, uh, for the trailblazers page. They do a really good job of putting these like full interview type things up and it's available for you there. What I want to do in the third segment is talk is play a little bit of my conversation with Lamar Hurd. Lamar joined me over the weekend prior to the Raptors game. We talked about a whole bunch of things, including Trendon Watford and CJ Ellaby, two guys who played well against the Raptors. And so I want to include a little bit of that conversation or play you that part of that conversation with Lamar I had because he he's got great insights. It's a ton of fun. That's Trevor's broadcaster, Lamar Hurd joining the show. So come back, third segment. That's Lamar will join us. It's, it'll be a ton of fun. Before we get there, though, let's talk about betonline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. We're wrapping up one of the best weekends of NFL football that there is. Uh, this would have been a great time to get in, in on betonline.ag, but you're not too late because they got odds and lines and props on every game and every sport. So the NBA's regular season happening all this week, you can get in on all those games. And when football's back for the conference championship round next weekend, you can bet on all that too. If you want to bet on anything else, you'll find it there from NHL hockey to soccer all over, uh, all over this fine planet, as well as combat sports, uh, there's a fight this weekend you could have bet on too. Uh, in addition, you can play your va- favorite Vegas casino games, all available at betonline.ag. And if you go there right now and use the promo code locked on, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus when you are making your first deposit. That's bet online where the game starts. Still a pass for his point guard. Still Mike Richmond. Still listening to Locked on Blazers. What I want to do for you now play a portion of my conversation with Blazers broadcaster Lamar Hurd. Lamar was kind enough to join me this weekend for a chat. We talked after the Blazers won Friday night against the Boston Celtics, but before they won Sunday against the Raptors, we discussed a bunch of things. And on Tuesday's show, um, this is Monday show, January 24th. On Tuesday's show, January 25th, I'll play the rest of my conversation where we talked about where Lamar and I talked about defense and Yusuf Nurkic and Amphrey Simons and Nazir Little and, and, and the growth of some of sort of the major parts. But because Trent and Watford and CJ LB both played really well against the Raptors, I want to play for you now my conversation with Lamar about what, we, what we've seen from those young guys. It doesn't update from the Raptors game just because of the timing of the conversation, but it still touches on our what we've seen from those two young guys and what we kind of think about them moving forward with the Blazers. Still totally relevant. And Lamar shares a bunch of good insights. So that's what I'm playing for you now. And make sure you come back tomorrow for more of my conversation with Lamar. We, we talked for a long time. I'm going to play you all of it. It was a ton of fun. So thanks to Lamar. And uh, here's our conversation about CJ Allaby and Trenton Watford. I want to ask you about a couple of young guys. Uh, what have you, you know, I'm a Trenton Watford believer. What have you liked about Trenton Watford's game? I like uh, how good his instincts are and his feel of just what to do. Um, I heard Coach Billups use the phrase that like Trenton is a basketball player. And, you know, if you don't know what he means, you hear that and you're like, well, duh, he's playing for a professional basketball team. Yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) But what Coach Billups is saying is he knows the basketball play to make instinctually. It's like Mm -hmm. it's it's natural to him. So you'll see sometimes Trenton might cut into the lane and he's always making the right cut. Watch him. Like, he's not clogging stuff up. He's not getting in the way. He's always making the right cut at the right time. And then he might catch 
And his one-two game is really good where he catches left to right, right to left with the feet, depending on what side of the floor he's, he's on. And he'll, he'll immediately turn into a pump fake and, and just feel you, you know, whatever happens, whatever you do, bam, he's into the next thing. Bam, he's the ball's not getting stuck with him. Uh, he just has a really good feel. I feel like he makes good players better yep. because he Agreed. comes in, you know, he knows his role. Uh, he knows how to play. Like he, if he's screening for somebody like Ant or Dame or CJ, one of the guards, he knows. I I I don't need to sit up here on, and hold the screen the whole time. My dude's committed. I'm out. I'm gone. And now I'm in an area where I'm available if you need me. But if you don't need me, I'm cool. You yeah, know? he works that short roll. He works that short roll really well. And on he defense, is. he's a great communicator. Like he oh really has a great sense. Did you um, see him in the Boston game? In, in yeah. The, in the middle of the What's zone. What's funny is you mentioned it on the zone, and I was like, I was trying, I was watching with my wife, and I was like, I was like, I was like, is I was like, I was like, Trendon's so good at this. And then you're like, you see Trendon pointing in the zone, and I was like, my yeah. man, <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's it just stood out. I mean, it's like screaming at you. It was so good. He's oh yeah. He he's communicating everything. He knows where to go. He knows the switches to take. It's it's just impressive for a rookie to yeah. be in there doing that right now. My thing is his feel is really impressive and his skills are way behind his feel. And that might sound bad, but to mm -hmm. me, that's promising because is feel is hard. Feel yeah. you need reps. Like Ant didn't have the feel. He got a whole bunch of reps. Yeah. Now he kicks ass because the yeah. feel has caught up with the skill. You can develop skill in the gym. You yeah. can go to the gym and get better at shooting. You can get stronger. You can tighten your handle. Like you could call up Lamar Hurd and get some, and you'll get that work in, in the summertime. Um, uh, you got to call up middle school coach, Mike. Hey, listen, we did finish second place twice. Okay. I'm just, I'll tell you All what, right. uh, we won the conference uh, eighth grade year. Okay. Um, <laughs> talk your talk, Mike. <laughs> um, but you can get better at the skills, but the feel, the knowing where to be on defense, the understanding, at a high level already being thrown into the mix and knowing just having that good feel on offense, feel on both ends. Like that to me is promising. I don't think, I don't, it's like, I'm not here. I like Trent Watford because I like a guy who kind of gets it and that you can mold a little bit better. I understand that his good games sometimes look like one for three with two rebounds, mm -hmm. but you watch him and you're like, okay, he's, he could play. And I think you mentioned it and it's a good point. Better with better players. Better, he complements better players because he's he's like got that role feel. When you put him out there with the all bench group, I don't think his skills get. Um, he doesn't what he does well isn't as magnified as much. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think he I think he can play with this team when they're whole. Yeah, yeah. You need uh, to get him out there. When when uh, you know I when uh, Zeller went down, I was asking Chauncey all about him, and and basically he was like, oh, he's gonna play anyways. Like I don't. He's like, Mike, what are you talking about? Like you don't need to ask me about his role. Like he's gonna play because he could play. He's good, man. He's yeah, he's good. And I know, like you know, we we haven't seen him shoot a whole lot of like threes or jumpers and all that, but I, I think he can shoot it. Now I'm not saying that can mean a lot of things. I'm not right, saying he's right. a 35 percent three point shooter, but I'm saying those skills you're talking about developing. I don't think he's very far off. Um, Sh shooting is a thing you can get better at. Yeah, and, and and like his mechanics are good. It's not like he has some kind of broken shot. Right. He just that's not his role right now when he checks in the games. He's not doing a whole lot of that. So he's, I got my eye on him because I think I'm, I'm serious, man. I think, I, I think he's gonna play a long time. Me too. I think I, he's an NBA. I really player. do. I think he's I an really NBA do. player. Yeah. Uh, no, last young guy I want to uh, ask you about before I get you out of here is, is CJ Ellaby. Um, obviously, he's he is stepping into a real role. He's part of the rotation. Um, what have you seen from Ellaby now that he's getting real minutes? I feel like his offensive game has been uh, increasing where uh, we're seeing him take shots that maybe we haven't seen him take in the past. Um, we're, we're seeing, first of all, he's a, CJ has a good feel for the game too. He does. Like similar to trend. And I think on both sides, I think, I think he's a menace defensively. Like he is all over the place. He'll great he'll anticipation. People. Yes. Um, when he's a help defender, like he is a terrific help defender. Like the way he meets people outside the paint, if he's a weak side defender down low and uh, always active. And he's also, he's one of those guys that is taller than yeah. he looks on TV. Like he's got some good size to him. That's a Luka Doncic effect. I mean, if you ever stand next to Luka, yeah. like, oh my God, he's big. <laughs> the first time I stood next to Luca, it was at the NBA Awards, and he had just won Rookie of the Year. And 
uh, our group from the Blazers, we had a group of like 10 people that were there and we were out like taking pictures. And then Luca and his crew, his mom, I think his agent, some people, they just walked, you know, like right in front of us and they were really respectful. They were like, I'm sorry, because they're trying to get to the picture spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, no, no, dude, we're the one, we need to move. <laughs> you know, like you're trying to take the picture with your rookie of the year trophy. So yeah. we'll move out the way so you can do that. <laughs> uh, but to your point, yes, he was. Yes, the size. He's a, he's a freak, dude. He's like, yes. I, he, and I didn't realize that because I hadn't no. stood by him before that time. No, he's a giant person. Uh, he's it's CJ LB. If, if CJ LB has a little bit of that freaky giant person, we're like, oh, you're huge. I didn't realize you were huge. Like, I didn't realize you play NBA basketball. I didn't realize you were gigantic. <laughs> um, yeah, that'll help him. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned his defensive reads. A uh, thing that's always stood out to me is, is, is that ability. Um, I think his skill level isn't quite there yet. His strength isn't quite there yet. I really like him as a cutter. Um, have you appreciated? Yeah, love him, yeah. Love, yeah. Love him as Cutter. I think that's something he developed at a really young age. I don't know if this was the beginning of it, but I remember I actually coached uh, uh, an AAU team against CJ Ellaby's team. He played with Kevin Porter Jr., who plays for the Rockets, yep. and then also a guy named PJ Fuller, who plays at University of Washington right now. PJ and Kevin Porter Jr. were basically McDonald's All Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, Kevin Porter Jr. was nuts. In the ninth school. grade. You yeah. couldn't do nothing with them. And so I remember the first time we played their team, Kevin Porter Jr. and P.J. Fuller probably combined for about 75, 75 points. I'm serious, like against my team. And my team, I had a, I had a pretty good team. Like I had kids on that team, five or six of them play, went play D1, are currently playing now. Like it was a, a solid team of basketball players, but these guys just destroyed us. And I remember C.J. Ellaby being on that team and almost being like a non-factor because they just weren't, they weren't coming off the basketball. Right. But he was always doing the right stuff. Like he was in the right spots. And so what happened is after they lit us up, the next time we played them, we started to do some things a little different. We started to throw some different defenses at them. We started to try to, you know, gauge like how much are y'all going to involve the rest of your team? And they didn't do it. And I just remember the whole time thinking like, man, that's crazy. Cause that one dude, CJ, yeah. which I didn't know him as CJ Ellaby at that time. Right, 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 right. Like that one dude right there, he's open. You know, like he's cutting to the right spots. Like he's the one dude that can actually blow up what we're trying to do defensively if they engage him because he's presenting himself in the right way. And that has, that has translated to the yeah. NBA game. He's doing the same exact thing. He's a, he's a hard cutter too. And he finishes his cuts. Yep. You know, like he's somebody he'll run all the way through his cut. He doesn't shortchange it. Um, and and, could, and so what that will do is it'll force, as you know, it'll force defense to react. I mean, yeah. if you if you half cut, defense doesn't feel the same need to step in the middle, stay at home, whatever. Like he forces you to do that. He works really well off Nurk when they because Nurk's gonna catch it on the right block. It's like he that's where that's where he's getting it. <laughs> um He's, you know, they go to him. He he will cut up from the opposite wing. He'll cut through, um, mm -hmm. or he'll cut down the the center of the paint. But he will draw a defender or work opposite baseline. Like he understands that cutting. It's like I, I've kind of joked on Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook only understands cutting for dunks. He's a great cutter. <laughs> if, great cutter if the rim's open. Elite. But a lot of times he stands around and watches because he doesn't appreciate the 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 gravity of cutting. Mm -hmm. If you cut, if you just move, just dummy mm -hmm. action on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. defenders will move like it's just natural it's how but but, but with, the, with the purpose too right oh yeah that's the thing some guys cut and they get in the way they mess right. stuff up and his cuts aren't those kind of cuts like it's a cut to open something else up for somebody else yeah he really understands the value of it he's got yeah. you know um all these dudes are good i've joked about it a bunch like Mm -hmm. so NBA players are good, but yeah. I, I love watching, I love watching the young guys kind of get it together. And this Blazer season has, um, you know, it's been a bummer for a lot of it. Uh, it's not what many of us expected. I thought this was going to be like a pretty competitive playoff team and they don't look like that. But I, I think the silver lining is Anthony Simons just stepping into his own as you're little looking like an NBA player, Nurk getting back to what he was and guys like Trendon and CJ kind of showing you some, a little bit of promise, a little, a little, a little bit that you can grab onto and say, okay, that can be something down the line. Uh, because you know, now it's, it's a little more forward looking, uh, enterprise than maybe for it sure. once was. Yeah, for sure. You know, for us as broadcasters, um, you know, people will ask me sometimes like, what's it, what's it like calling games when they're just blowouts? So like the last time we you tell him you work with Kevin Calabro, it's like, <laughs> it's like going on a fishing trip. Yeah, seriously, seriously. Um, but it's like the, 
it's not so much of like a blowout or it's just how can can a game be competitive? Yeah. So like the game in Miami a, a, a few nights ago, Blazers didn't win, but that was a fun game. Yeah. Call and watch and see the things developing and watch the matchups and all that because it was competitive. And those young guys, they were out there playing. They were competing. They were they were responding like that's 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 what you want to see. Oh, yeah. You know, and and if you build enough of that and, you know, you got the right pieces involved, that's when you start talking about winning and being a contender and all that. But none of that happens if you don't have like a foundation. And you've seen a lot of foundation over these last few weeks. The, these young guys, it's, it's been so fun to watch them. Yeah. Credit to Chauncey Billups, who has been better. He has he has learned on the job and he is better at coaching now. Absolutely. Than he was at the beginning of the year. Just the way that anyone learning on the job is going to be like he he's he has figured out a lot of things with this team um and he he looks like it and like you know it wasn't working in november they are less talented now than they were in november and they look like a better basketball team like yeah. straight up um so yeah. credit to credit to coach phillips on that one for sure. for sure lamar thank you so much for joining us um we I'm will sorry, uh, we'll have to do it again soon uh dear listeners watch watch the broadcast watch <laughs> lamar's gonna lamar's gonna make you smart about the team this stuff that we're talking about here on the show Lamar brings to every broadcast. He's talking about communicating in the zone. He's talking about the micro skills, what makes hoops fun. So, uh, you know, appreciate Lamar. Uh, <laughs> that's my recommendation. Um, seriously, though, thanks so much. Thank my pleasure, Mike. Thanks, man. Dear listeners, tell your friends about this podcast. Tell them to look for it wherever they already get podcasts and also on YouTube. If you're listening this late into the show, you've got to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's just how it works. I would... I would appreciate it. And I think you'll enjoy it too. A look inside what my basement looks like and even to see a smiling Lamar Hurd on the other side as well. Uh, five days a week, wherever you get podcasts, also on YouTube. Make it your first listen. Come back and listen to the next one. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.